So turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 25. Genesis 25, and I'll read from verse 12 through verse 34, which is the end of the chapter. Genesis 25, verses 12 to 34. This is the Word of God. These are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's servant, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, named in the order of their birth, Neboeth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, Adbiel, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tema, Jetur, Nafish, and Kedema. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their encampments, twelve princes according to their tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. He breathed his last and died, and, when got, and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is opposite Egypt to the direction of Assyria. He settled over against all his kinsmen. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was forty years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah his wife conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was sixty years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, Sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Thus far the reading of God's word this morning. Brothers and sisters, last couple of weeks ago, you might remember, we, uh, we took a look at that phrase, uh, gathered to his fathers. There's another phrase, there's a curious phrase in Hebrew, which occurs uh, no less than ten times in the book of Genesis, and that is, in the Hebrew, it's Elah Toledot, and it means, these are the generations of. Some translations say, this is the account of or something along that same line. Now, scholars are not completely sure what is behind the repetitive use of that phrase. Some have concluded that its appearance is just a way of Moses marking chapter headings when he moves on in the next, to the next section of his organized history. But in observing its usage, it seems to indicate something more to me than just chapter headings. And so I want to make just a couple of cursory remarks or observations about that phrase here. 
Number one is the phrase always speaks, whenever it appears in, 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 in Genesis, excuse me, it always speaks of very precise and specific information. Uh, whether it be people or places or things. We find it in Genesis chapter 9, for example, where it says these are the generations of Noah. And then we read of the historical account of the call of Noah, of Noah's building the ark, and of the coming of the flood, which destroys all other human life save himself his, and his family. And then you see it in Genesis 10 verse 1, where it says these are the generations of the sons of Noah, and that's followed by a generous listing of the specific descendants, which develops into the table of nations, so-called. That list of names eventually narrows to a focus uh, at, on, the, on the generations of Shem, Noah's son, in Genesis 11.10, and then to the generations of Terah, in 11.27. So, so it's very curious to me uh, to discover that the very first time that phrase appears in the book of Genesis is in chapter 2, verse 4, where it says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. When they were created in the day, the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now that verse gets a lot of attention from some scholars because that's the verse where the second use of that word day appears. The first use of the word day in Genesis appears in Genesis chapter 1, verse 15, where it specifically defines the word day. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And then the word is used sequentially to describe each of the six days of creation. But when we get to chapter 2, verse 4, the word day takes on a second meaning, a more general, a more unspecific meaning, where day means either a moment in time or perhaps a, an era. Uh, for instance, Genesis 35, 3 says, "...the God who answers me in the day of my distress." That's a general kind of time frame. But what about the phrase, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth? The heavens and the earth have no descendants, but neither can the phrase be dismissed as just poetry or rhetoric because it is not used that way in the other nine times we see it in the book of Genesis. It is always used realistically. There is always only one meaning for that phrase. Unlike the word day, which has two meanings, this phrase has only one. So it seems most natural to conclude that this phrase is speaking about the days that we experience, the evening and the morning, the next day in our own lives, all of which follow the pattern of the six days of creation in which the Lord created the heavens and the earth. A second observation about that phrase is, as specific as the listings of the names and the details and of the accounts are that follow that phrase, these are the generations of, it does not appear to be committed to following the covenantal line of promise. That's what we've almost assumed would happen, that telescoping effect, if you remember where we start off with a broad report of creation and we scope down and then it moves down f further and further to just one man in the whole world. We would expect that to follow a providential line, but we don't see that happening. First, we do see it when, the, when we trace those phrases from, uh, from Noah to Shem to Terah. Uh, uh, you know, but here in chapter 25, we read of that phrase before listing the sons of Ishmael and that in quite a specific way. And then on to Isaac. And so we know the covenant line does not go through the line of Ishmael. Why is that there? But the most interesting th thing to me as a Bible student is, there is no place where we find the words, these are the generations of Abraham. There is no place uh, where that appears. If that phrase was a chapter heading, 
it would definitely ha- direct our attention to the generations of the patriarch Abraham, for he has been the center of all of this history so far. And then a third observation about that phrase is, is we find this phrase in two other places outside of the book of Genesis. You find it in Numbers chapter 3, verse 1, for example, where it says these are the generations of Aaron and of Moses. And that underscores the scriptural testimony of the true historicity of the exodus out of Egypt and of the establishment of the ceremonial law uh, and the priestly lineage down from Moses' brother Aaron. And then finally, that phrase appears in the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 4, verse 18, where we read these words. These are the generations of Perez. Who in the world is Perez? Well, Perez, as it turns out, is one of the sons of Judah, a son of Jacob, a son of Isaac, a son of Abraham. By using that phrase there, the author of the book of Ruth is reaching way back in literal history to connect to the patriarch Abraham and bring that line up to the time uh, where it includes the Moabitess woman Ruth and then proceeds to project that line forward in time until they arrive at the person of David. Now, all of that is to teach and prove the point to us that the bloodline of Abraham, while meticulously recorded in Scripture, as we have just noticed, and as we've read elsewhere, was never an exclusive parameter of God's covenant. It has never been by bloodline that God's promise is passed down from one generation to the next. It has always been handed down by faith. It has always been handed down by faith. So that phrase, just to wrap this part up, the, these are the generations of, does two things. Number one, it always speaks of a specific historical record giving us grounding and giving us confidence that the Bible's message is indeed true and is indeed authentic. And number two, it displays for us the guiding hand of a sovereign, providential God who decrees the lives of all people, not just in a broad brush way, but dealing with each individual life that is coming to pass, who decrees that all of the lives before Him, even as every day of creation is decreed, in precisely the direction that He has for them before the foundation of the world began. In other words, what we are being introduced to here is that God is in control of every individual man, woman, boy, and child, boy and girl, as well as over control of all things, and and that in such a way that we learn of God's electing, decreeing purposes, not just of the family of man himself, but even of time itself. Well, that leads us to our present study here in chapter 25. These are the generations of Isaac, verse 19 tells us. Now, even before we learn very much about Isaac himself, the account goes right into the birth of the twins and the way that their relationship develops. We can see what kind of characters these guys turn out to be. But more than just the details of two siblings who have their issues getting along, this one account is going to be used by the rest of Scripture going forward to teach and reinforce that much larger theological theme of God's electing purposes and will. This is the the most blatant place where that doctrine begins to be taught in all of Scripture. Now, if you were to ask me to teach you the doctrine of election or predestination, I would probably start by directing your attention to the third chapter of the Westminster Confession of Faith and give you the lesson that is stated there in propositional form, which goes like this. 
By the decree of God, for the manifestation of His glory, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life, and others foreordained to everlasting death. And as I taught you this doctrine, I would try to do so, you see, with the counsel of chapter 3, paragraph 8 of the Confession, that tells me that this doctrine needs to be handled with special prudence and care, so I don't beat somebody over the head with it, in other words, just as John Calvin had previously said that the doctrine of predestination should be treated when he wrote it in the Institutes. But our Lord, through His Word, does not teach this doctrine here propositionally. He teaches it personally. He divides nations. He divides families. He even divides brothers. Now, we've seen this already. This isn't just the start. We've seen this already in the same way we read of Noah back in Genesis chapter 6, who was chosen, elected of God, and allowed along with his family to escape the flood which destroyed all the rest of mankind. We also read of Abram in Genesis chapter 12, who with Sarah was called out by God away from his family to receive the promise of God's covenant himself, and it would be passed on to his seed, and it was not to be including the family that he left back in Haran. And now, rather than backing off on that subject of election, lest he offend us or trouble our sensitivities, it appears the Lord actually doubles down here. Isaac may be the miraculous child of God's covenant with Abraham, but not even Isaac's own children, Abraham's grandchildren, will both have an unquestioned place in the covenant line of promise and hope. The jury starts off out on their fate and their destiny. So what is being taught here? When we read this strange account of their birth, what is being taught here? Well, the lesson begins with Rebecca's pregnancy. For 20 years, Rebecca has been barren. That reminds us of the many, many more years than that that Sarah waited And because of that, knowing their waiting gives us hope because the Lord tells us that we need to learn in our impatience to wait on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord is a very important theme for us to learn and is meant to encourage us that blessings will indeed follow upon the one who does that. And that barrenness, we read, ends with Isaac's prayer. Abraham had dutifully taught his son to pray to this God. And Isaac in his adulthood did not fail to do that. And after he prays, Rebekah conceives. You know, there are always the skeptics who want to argue that, well, if God is sovereign, God determines all things. If He does whatever pleases Him, then there's no use to pray. What good would prayer do? But Isaac proves that the skeptic is wrong. And this record rebukes that attitude as nothing more than unbelief. To believe in God's sovereignty, you see, what it does to the true believer is it humbles him. It does not make him angry with God. It humbles the believer to think that God is in control of everything. And it is out of that humility that the true Christian is moved to pray. But immediately after conception, even in the womb, there is struggle, we're told. If, where there is struggle in the womb. If you ever wonder about when life begins, do you ever think about that verse? Not only are there twins 
There are nations in there. Whatever purpose these boys will serve in God's plan, it is clear that they are human and that they are very much alive and that a destiny beyond their own lives is yet ahead. Not only is abortion on demand murder, but it is also very self-centered. It is very immediate. The consideration of these specific children, as well as their own future generations, are not respected. And because of this struggle in her womb, what does Rebecca do? She also prays. As a husband, Isaac has also led his wife by teaching her to pray to the Lord God. And how she also must pray, and how she as a woman may cry out to God, even as Hagar had done. And then just as with Hagar, the Lord spoke to Rebekah. And notice, what he said to her is written down in the Word of God. It has become part of the holy record of the Scriptures. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Two nations? Two peoples? What are we to make of this? Hadn't Abraham been promised a unity? Genesis chapter 12, God promised a great nation to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 15, God promised your own children will be your heirs. But in Genesis chapter 17, He changed the wording. You shall be the father of a multitude of nations. The house of Abraham was meant by God to populate the land. We saw that first in the peoples that came from Abraham's nephew, Lot, the Moabites and the Ammonites. And then we saw that in the generations of Ishmael, which we just read. And here we begin to see at the beginnings of both the Edomites that come from Esau, and the Israelites that will come from Jacob. So Genesis teaches us specifically and literally that we have all come from the same source. First, we all came from Adam and Eve. But then, the, with, with that descendancy starts all over again after the flood with Noah and, the son, and his sons, And now with Abraham, the scriptures go into all of this depth, all of this detail, all of these specific names to teach the truth. We are all of one blood. We are all of one lineage. All mankind is of one race. But the Lord had even more to tell Rebekah. Two peoples from within you shall be divided. If God was against division, if He was against infighting in the family, this prophecy makes it clear that He could have stopped that division right then and there. But this is a prophecy of God's ordained will. You know, many Christians today go just far enough to say, yes, God has foreknowledge, but not predestination. And in saying that, I'm thinking the effort they are making is to protect what they think is the all-important notion that each individual must remain still free to choose God on their own, free to determine one's own eternal fate. They would even stress to us that the very integrity of the gospel is tied up with that. He must be able to choose God or else the offer of the gospel makes no sense. But God is saying here, they shall be divided. 
And it's ordained by God to be so. And while the lives of both Jacob and Esau will only demonstrate their sinfulness, they will be responsible for their individual sins and they will reap the consequences for those sins. Nevertheless, even such strife, such wrath of man is not only permitted, it's ordained of God. It achieves, the wrath of man achieves God's eternal purposes. And yes, the very integrity of the gospel is at stake. If any from this world of sinful men and sinful women are to be saved and redeemed at all, it will not because they become convinced of the truth It will be because in God's sovereign will and power He first sends His Son into the world, as John 3.16 says, and submits Him over to death at the hands of very angry and wrathful people, and then uses the the Son's own shed blood to cover the uh, the unrighteousness and sins of His people, and then faithfully sends His Holy Spirit to change their hearts from stone into hearts of flesh. If anyone is to be saved by the gospel, then it must be this sovereign triune God who does it. Before you were even born, the Lord knew you. And your life is always and entirely in His hands. And so what we see in the birth of these twins and the early years of their growth only confirms what we know about them and what we know about ourselves. Probably reminds you of your own family at home, doesn't it? You know, there's a question that your elders will pose to you from time to time to make you think. Are we sinners because we sin? Or do we sin because we're sinners? It sounds as though that's a a trick question. But it really does teach the difference of this very profound truth. Our individual sins, yours and mine, our individual sins are just that. They are sins. We break the moral law of God. We break it specifically. We break it literally. And each one of those sins alone is worthy to condemn us to death and to hell. But those sins alone are not what condemns us. We are not sinners based on our own record of sinfulness. Instead, we choose willfully to sin because our nature is sinful. Sinful from birth. We have inherited Adam's guilt, the Lord's judgment. We are conceived and born in sin, and that hatred and anger toward God and the condemnation that is rightfully due for that inherited condition is something we do pass on to our children. We are indeed, by nature, the generations of Adam. Literally, specifically, individually, we are to receive the wages of sin. We are all worthy of the judgment of God. That, you see, cannot be dismissed. It cannot be excused. We can't soften that truth by thinking that guilt and sin are just figurative kinds of language, just allegory of uh, and mythological kind of language describing why people are sometimes a little more grumpy than others or why the bible or that the bible makes an analogy of life to try to let us understand reality as we see it today the only salvation the only deliverance open to you against the literal terrible judgment of god is the sovereign electing power of god And rather than that being a hopeless condition to you this morning, you have been told in the gospel how that salvation may be gained. You are to cry out to God in prayer. 
Do not be fatalistic or apathetic, but implore God for His will in your life. When you do that, you are already demonstrating His power is at work within you. Trust in that. Act upon that. Believe in that. And the Lord will hear you and He will respond to you. The Lord is the sovereign God of all. And that means that He can do all His holy will. You are utterly dependent, you see, first on His mercy to withhold from you that which you deserve. And you are completely blessed and favored when He extends to you His grace, when He gives to you that which you don't deserve. That is the gospel. Pray with me if you would. Father, I thank you for the opportunity this has been for us to understand that which is very difficult to receive, especially to receive it for the first time. We confess, O Lord, it is something the Church of Christ at large abandons in our day. We don't want to hear any bad news. We just want to hear how Jesus can help us and be a benefit to us. But Lord, your sovereignty humbles us. It tells us we must renounce our pride. We must bow the knee to you now. We must call you Lord and Savior, for that is what you are, whether our hearts accept you or deny you. And then, Lord, we must cry out to you. Like Isaac cried out to you. Like Rebekah cried out to you. Like Hagar cried out to you. Like all of God's people cry out to you in turn, you hear them. You reach out to them. You answer their prayers. You bring them to yourself and you rejoice over them. We thank you. We thank you that we can be among that number even now. Move us to pray to you, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.